I waited a long time to make a video on Stefano Tsitsipas, but now I have the right context because he just won Monte Carlo for the third time and he is back in form. But over the last 12 months or so, there's been so much written on Stefano Tsitsipas, more specifically about his backhand, which led me to do a lot of research on his game in general. Now, two years ago, I talked about Tsitsipas' serve in one of my videos. While Stefanos has an excellent serve, there are some quirks on his first serve. The second serve is fine. He kicks it really well. The first serve is very good as well. Don't get me wrong. However, it is not optimal by any means. The toss sometimes drifts to 11 o'clock and he doesn't rotate properly on his first serve. Now, interestingly, Stefanos did adapt a pinpoint stance serving style early this year, which he now thankfully abandoned because it wasn't working for him. It never looked natural. But like I said, despite some of these technical inefficiencies, Stefanos has an excellent serve and uses the one-two punch combination really well, meaning a big first serve with also a lot of variety where he slices it and kicks it and then he backs it up with one of the greatest forehands in the world. But if you take a look at any post featuring Stefano Tsitsipas on social media prior to Monte Carlo, you're going to see thousands of comments saying that Stefanos has a horrible backhand. Now look, these are just trolls and I don't pay any attention to these type of comments. However, during the Australian Open, when Nick Kyrgios was commentating on Stefano Tsitsipas' first round match, Nick did say that Stefanos has one of the best one-two punches in the world, meaning the serve and the forehand, but that the backhand can be a weakness at times. So this led me to do a tremendous amount of research on Stefanos Tsitsipas' backhand. Now the first thought that I had was the following. You cannot make the final of the Australian Open, make another multitude of semifinals at the Australian Open, go deep into the semifinals, finals, and take titles at Master Series tournaments, win the World Tour Finals by taking out Federer in the semis, going up two sets to love against Djokovic in the French Open final, and the match that impressed me the most from Tsitsipas was when he lost 7-5 in the third in 2021 in the Barcelona final against Rafael Nadal. So as I started doing research on Stefanos's backhand to try to find some technical flaws, this stuck in the back of my mind because I do believe that it's absolutely impossible to have these type of results, to play tennis at the very elite level with technical weaknesses on the forehand and the backhand. Now on the serve, it's a little bit different because the serve is by far the most complex shot in tennis. And also there are three types of serves that what can hit. And also there's the first serve and the second serve. So when it comes to the elite level, especially on the woman's side, you are sometimes going to see technical deficiencies. And even on the men's side, there are some player with small technical deficiencies on their serve. However, from the ground, I do believe that it's absolutely impossible to have a weakness and to play tennis at that level. And now I'm gonna bring you a little bit behind the scenes on the Intuitive Tennis YouTube channel and what I do and what I have been doing for many, many years, which is conducting research on professional strokes and how you can fall into a trap where you find strokes on the internet to support your hypothesis. Because a lot of the footage that's found online is out of context. So what I do is I will screen record matches on my iPad or I will record the screen on my TV and I will use that footage to analyze. However, when I conduct video analysis, I need two points of view. I need rear footage and side footage. So when it comes to the side footage, this is something that you're not gonna catch in a match and this is where you have to go on YouTube and find footage that's mostly from practice sessions. Now the danger in looking at side footage from professional players is that the strokes are out of context. You don't know the intention of the player. You don't know if they're going cross court or down the line. You don't know if the shot was out or in. And some players are playing with a lack of intensity. So sometimes, you can draw false conclusions when you watch practice footage, especially one that is recorded from the side, and this is regarding all strokes. So what happened when I was analyzing Stefanos's backhand is that early on, I did find two clips where I did see a technical deficiency on his backhand. And this goes back to 
fundamentals versus style, something that I talk about a lot on the Intuitive Tennis YouTube channel. I talk about this in more detail on Intuitive Tennis Premium, which is available on intuitivetennis.com. And it's the fact that there are fundamentals that all high-level players have in common, but there are also stylistic differences. So when it comes to the Tsitsipas backhand, he has a style where he doesn't continue to rotate as much as players such as Team or Vavrinka. Now the confusing thing is that some players will continue to rotate on some backhands and will stay more sideways on others. Now understand that all players rotate forward, so all players will load aggressively on their backhands, but some will hold the rotation while others will allow it to continue. And by accumulating a lot of clips, especially ones that were shot from very close up, this confirmed to me that there are absolutely no technical flaws on the Tsitsipas backhand. Now, going back to what Kyrgios said, is it true maybe that at times Tsitsipas has a weakness on his backhand side? Yes, absolutely, but this does not have anything to do with his technique. So when you watch Tsitsipas play on clay, you can see that he backs up a little bit further than he does on hard court, and he puts a little bit more air on his backhand. So the confidence on his backhand is increased drastically when he plays on clay. He gives himself a little bit more time, puts more shape on the ball, and indeed hits the backhand heavier and harder. He also has the confidence to go up the line when he needs to. Now on hard court, especially when it's a fast one, it doesn't mean that Tsitsipas has a bad backhand, but at times he is a little bit more reactive and defensive on that side compared to when he plays on clay courts. Now when Tsitsipas is at his best and when he's going deep in hard court tournaments, his backhand is aggressive even on hard courts. And now let's talk about the Tsitsipas road to the Monte Carlo title. When I saw that he beat Echeverry 1-0, I was like, wow. Okay, this is a serious result because Echeverry is a top player and Stefano's only lost one game. So I thought right away, okay, he's playing well. I think he's going to have a chance to go deep in this tournament. Then he had a nervy match against Zverev where he was up 5-love in the second and almost lost that set, but he came through. He comfortably beat Kachanov and then a controversial match against Sinner where Stefano's played extremely well. But at 3-1 Sinner, in the third set, breakpoint center, second serve Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas hits the second serve about this long. Now, center didn't stop the point. He should have. The umpire did not say anything. Tsitsipas ended up winning that point and winning the whole match. Now, if this serve would have been called correctly, this would have been double break for center. And I don't think center loses that match up two breaks. So we've seen now several instances of bad umpire decisions, uh, one of the worst ones I've ever seen in Estoril, but now two bad ones in Monte Carlo as well. The one in the Runa match was pretty bad too. And quite frankly, the mistake from the umpire cost Sinner the match. So it's just very unfortunate to see this because the players are the ones that suffer from this and it's about time that even on the clay court we introduce electronic line calling. Now I want to put respect on Kasper Rude's name because just like Tsitsipas did over the last 12 months, Casper gets dragged on social media because he's never won any title that's higher than a 250. And Casper is an unbelievable player. You don't reach the finals of the ATP Tour finals. You don't make three Grand Slam finals, two at the French, one at the US Open, if you're not an absolute elite level player. Casper was also in the final of Miami. So this guy knows how to play on any surface, but of course his favorite surface is clay. And in my opinion, he's a top five clay court player in the world. And he's got a legitimate chance to go deep in every tournament for the rest of the clay court season. But not only that, Casper is a great player. He can do extremely well in hard court tournaments as well. And it's only a matter of time until he starts winning 500s, thousands, and maybe even a grand slam down the road. So I'm putting respect on Casper's name. But Tsitsipas was too strong in the final. I just love watching Stefanos play when he's on the top of the game because he has variety on clay. He serves well, has one of the best forehands in the world, puts a tremendous amount of spin on his backhands, and also loves to come to the net. If you guys have not seen Clay Court versus Hardcore Tactics, a video that I released a few days ago, I explained that clay courts are actually really suitable for coming to the net and attacking. It gives you a little bit more time and the bounces can be in your favor. And that's something that Stefanos does extremely well. And if I think about who are the best clay court players 
in the world. I'm thinking of Alcaraz, I'm thinking of Djokovic, I'm thinking of Nadal, and the next player that's in my head is Stefano Tsitsipas. And now let me finish off this Monday morning rant by talking about Djokovic. He had a strange tournament. He was shaking on the bench, kind of similar to what he did at the World Tour Finals a couple of years ago. He also had difficulties breathing, and over the years watching Djokovic, I know that when I see him on the court exhausted and having physical issues, that this doesn't really mean anything. And look, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that he's faking these physical problems. What I'm saying is that he is really good at overcoming physical problems and coming out as the winner of the match. He is by far the mentally strongest player in the history of tennis. Now, was this a good tournament for Djokovic? I do think it's a step in the right direction. He won three matches, but he did lose to a player that he's never lost to and that nobody expected him to lose to. So here's how confidence works in tennis. If you lose more than what you're accustomed to, you're gonna lose confidence. But it also works in the other way. For example, if you start losing the players that you normally wouldn't lose to, for example, Djokovic lost to Nardi in Indian Wells, and now he lost to Rude at Monte Carlo. Other players see this, and the next time they step on a court against Djokovic, they know, okay, Djokovic lost to Nardi, and he lost to Root, maybe I have a chance against him. It's a completely different scenario than when Djokovic is winning every single tournament. Players will not have that thought in their head. So it's really a double-edged sword where Djokovic himself doesn't have the same confidence that he normally has, and other players have more confidence when they face him. But Djokovic is the GOAT, and he can turn this around on a dime, especially when we're talking about Grand Slam tournaments, best of five. This is where it becomes more challenging to beat Djokovic. And I do think that he's going to come out of the little funk that he's in in 2024.